a bit of an outsider, right? I don't know anything about chemometrics. So today's talk will be like a broad overview of different applications of machine learning to different fields of science. Um, my career, my background is in computer science and machine learning, so I've been working on this for I don't know, 15, 20 years now. And I, I'm a bit of a generalist, so I worked in the beginning on time series, then on uh, computer vision, then I did work related to search engines, I worked in reinforcement learning, and most recently I got interested in these applications of machine learning to science and engineering. And so that's what I want to share with you here. So I will split the talk into different sections. In the first one, I will talk about biology and I will tell you a little bit about my experience when I worked at Google DeepMind on the AlphaFold project. Then I will move on to talk a little bit about physics and engineering in particular, uh, how machine learning is now being used to try to solve uh, problems in this domain, things like uh, solving partial differential equations. Uh, I will then, Tell you a little bit of what we are doing at uh, at Inductiva, my uh, startup company that we created uh, about three years ago, at the intersection of scientific computing and AI, and close off with you know some perhaps some insights about why deep learning is working across such different fields. And I I didn't put it here, but if we have the time, I can. I also have some slides about math and theory improvement, which is like a completely different domain, but where uh, deep learning is also being used. So let's see if you guys are interested. Yeah. So starting with biology. Um. So there was this very big open problem in computational biology called protein structure prediction, and it's basically about learning a mapping from. Uh, what you can think of as a, a string of letters, right? Which is the sequence of amino acids, and there's uh, about 21 different amino acids. And you want to predict what will be the three-dimensional three shape of the protein that this sequence of amino acids uh, represents. So this is uh, very important for uh, people in, in biology because, you know, proteins are like the workforce in, in cells, right? They do a lot of different things. And the, the belief uh, that holds, uh, seems to hold true, is that the, pro, the amino acid sequence determines the structure and the structure determines the function. So if you know how to predict this mapping, you can then go further and understand how things work and how things break when there's like some mutation and you, you change some amino acids and so on. So, uh, just to give you a little bit of context, in, we worked on. Uh, I worked at this project when I was part of uh, DeepMind. I, I was there between 2015 and 2019. So just as a reminder, De DeepMind was a, a startup in the UK that bought, got acquired by Google in 2014, I think, because they got famous by uh, solving uh, computer games using their own networks. So they had this algorithm called Deep. DQN, deep uh, Q networks, in which for a, a very different range of games, like uh, for from this Atari console, so there were 50 different games, the neural network would just see the raw pixels of the image and it would learn to play the game uh, by itself, just trying to maximize the score. And so there was this reinforcement learning algorithms and the functions that were learned to control this uh, player were neural networks. Previously, this was never achievable because there was no stable algorithm to, to learn, to train these neural networks in such a regime. And then after that, uh, there was also this, this big success of using deep learning for games, but now not these video games, but these board games like Go. So the also Go uh, happened around 2015, 2016 more or less at the time that I, I joined. So there was a, a, quite a lot of excitement building up about deep learning. Uh, yeah, so off we go. And then folding more precisely is also about the temporal evolution of how proteins take their shape, whereas protein structure prediction is just predicting the final shape. Anyways, so people in the University of Washington had um, created a game with a graphical user interface for humans 
to gamify the process of uh, predicting the structure of proteins. So there was this uh, experimental idea of so like, can humans actually, if we give them some feedback information, which looks like a score, which is computed based on these uh, physical uh, rules, these energy functions we know about the current configuration. So if two things are too close to each other, there are clashes, so this is a bad confirmation. Because of this series of rules that you can use, uh, you know, based on physics to evaluate a current configuration, let's say the hypothesis was, can humans actually move it around with the mouse and change the shape to minimize this energy function? And it's like maximizing their score. So we thought, well, maybe, you know, DeepMind has been working on solving games with deep learning and the deep reinforcement learning. Can we uh, use similar algorithms to, to tackle a scientific problem? So we worked on it for, uh, you know, just a few days. Obviously, we didn't do anything very, we didn't have any breakthrough in three days. But it was enough to get uh, people excited. Uh, Dennis Assad is the CEO and Mustafa Sulme, also one of the co-founders, to actually tell us, you guys should start working on this full time. So it was actually, a, uh, I mentioned this because it's quite interesting, it was actually a bottom-up uh, initiative, right? That started the project that then ended up having quite a success. Um, and so at that point, we were like, okay, so how are we going to measure progress? And it turns out there is a biannual competition called CAST, in which um, every two years, there's uh, the community organizes a competition in which they keep a few dozen uh, protein structures uh, secret. So they have already experimental determined, experimentally determined what is the structure, but it's not yet widely public. And they just show the uh, sequence of amino acids and they say, okay, submit your uh, predictions. And then it is evaluated by basically computing a distance metric to see comparing to the ground truth. So this had been like had been organized for a few years. These were like the results on the previous edition. And um, so we got started working on it. Initially, what we tried to do was like, okay, let's start from something very similar to the state of the art so far, but give it a little bit more of a machine learning flavor. flavor. And so what existed at that point was this idea of uh, you have a current uh, conformation as a current uh, configuration of your protein and you can call one of these energy functions to evaluate it. Does it look good? And then you do a, a big search process. So you change it a little bit, you ask again, is it good? So it, it's like a optimization process in which you are progressively changing a little bit the, the state. So we said, okay, let's try to do something along those lines, but do it from scratch without using previous system and do it from the ground up with machine learning. So in the initial version, we just implemented one of these uh, generative models. No, we now uh, Gen AI is very fashionable, right? But uh, even at that point, there were already a lot of generative models appearing, in particular one called draw in which you would train it to suggest the shape of uh, small fragments of proteins. So sequences of, subsequences of length, I don't know, eight to 12 amino acids. So you'd say, okay, this is the sequence of amino acids, suggest me a, a likely shape of this. And this would have been trained in a data set of, you know, a lot of fragments that were known. So then you would replace that shape, subshape inside the big protein and ask again the, the, the energy function, whether it was better or not. And then you do this kind of stochastic search, like simulated any linear form. So this was um, already interesting. It was like getting close to what was the state of the art there, but it was, I guess, a simpler system. The previous system had a lot of components and they were not learned from scratch, so they had a lot of rules. But there was still, um, um, many challenges to be solved. Then there was um, a further step that was taken, which was, okay, given that we, ah, I forgot to mention something, but obviously as a machine learning researcher, the first thing you hope for is like, just predict something end to end. Like, okay, if you have a big enough data set, just take the sequence of amino acids and predict the shape directly. What happened is that if you do this naively, it just didn't work. There was not enough data for that. 
and even small changes in if small errors in your prediction compound a lot because if you are let's say predicting the angles between consecutive amino acids if you mess up one of the angles like your protein is all like wide open and then it's, it's a big impact in the metric of relevance so one idea was like okay given that we cannot predict this directly maybe we can predict something very similar to which which is predict pairwise distances of amino acids so um, rather than like predicting angles between consecutive amino acids, which can have this problem of accumulating errors, just focus on predicting the distances between the final distances between pairs of amino acids. So now you're predicting like a n by n matrices of all pairwise distances. So actually doing this and even modeling what your belief was about the distribution of that distance worked really well and was really stable. But then you still have to do this uh, optimization step. So now you have this prediction, it's like this, this big map. And now you still need to search for the uh, configuration that, uh, that best aligns with your predictions. It turned out that just doing some very basic gradient descent algorithm over these predictions of the neural network worked already really well. So you no longer needed to do this stochastic search, which is very exhaustive, you could do some sort of very efficient gradient descent over the outputs of the neural network. And this, basically what happened, and this led to the first nature paper of AlphaFold, this already got us there. So when the first AlphaFold results came out, we came on top already, beating with a reasonable, you know, nice margin over the previous uh, in the two years earlier. So actually, this is where my uh, involvement with AlphaFold starts, because then I'm in country and project and so on, stayed working in other things at DeepMind. But what happened later is that uh, the team continued and grew, and it got a lot more sophisticated. So now, instead of being in this regime where you have a neural network predicting something and then you still need an optimizer step after that, they managed to do it full end-to-end -end direct prediction without having to do a, an optimizer. So this involved a lot of experimentation with different architectures of neural network. <laughs> it involved having clever ways of accessing a database of uh, known structures, um, but still making everything end-to-end uh, -end differentiable so that you could backdrop over everything. And so this was a, you know, a lot more complex in terms of machine learning, but on the other hand, it was just like one system that learns from um, doing the direct prediction. You don't have this prediction followed by optimization and then the flow of information gets broken. And so when they managed to do this, the gap was even stronger, right? So the AlphaFold 2 really approached the level of uh, almost experimental accuracy. So it becomes almost undistinguishable from, you know, maybe there's experimental leisure in, in errors in the measurement. So some people that are <clears throat> co-organizers of this competition started saying that maybe this is like, it's almost sold, right? Um, cool. So after that, I, uh, after a while I decided to come back to Portugal and I have been away like 13 years. And we, we launched so with the founder that was also at Google, a startup called Inductiva, in which we, we decided to make a bet on this field of AI for science and engineering, but we didn't focus uh, particularly on biology. We actually started looking around uh, in physics and, and different fields of engineering, like mechanical engineering, civil engineering, and so on. So what I'm gonna talk here is just about things that we noticed that are happening in the research and I'll try to give you a brief overview of that. So in physics, it turns out for some <laughs> amazing, uh, surprising quality of the universe that uh, most physical uh, laws are described by these uh, partial differential equations, right? So 
these are just equations that uh, relate functions and their partial deriv derivatives, right? So for example, here is a heat equation. I'm, I'm not at all from, from this domain, but in, uh, in mathematics, in, if you think as a mathematician, what you want to find is the, the functions uh, that respect some boundary conditions, for example, the tech, if you're modeling heat diffusion is like the temperature at this boundary starts with this value. As time goes on, how does it diffuse? So you want to find the function that uh, respect those initial conditions, but also this relation between uh, functions and their derivative that is known already, right? It's like a physical law. And yeah, like I was saying, for some reason, this is everything, right? Like in quantum mechanics, you have Schrodinger equation, fluid dynamics, you have uh, Navier-Stokes, electromagnetism, you have Maxwell. So the physicists in the others know better than me. But this seems to be everywhere. And the applications are incredible, right? So if you are doing material design or direct design or aerospace or automotive or anything, you have to model any physical process. If you are able to you know, model this kind of systems and solve these kind of equations, you, you have an impact, right? So the, the traditional way to approach it <laughs> has been through uh, numerical solvers, right? So these are, or let me start by saying, in terms of analytical solutions for partial differential equations, it's very limited, right? You only solve toy problems, like things that, that don't matter for industry. Things that impact the real world will be numerical approximations. And you'll, there are methods like finite differences, finite elements, finite volumes, and so on. But what they have in common is that they tend to discretize uh, space and uh, and also sometimes the time component into a very fine grid, a mesh or a grid. So, and then they do this kind of a, a, a linear approximations to derivatives and so on. But what this tends to mean is that uh, simulating relatively uh, simulating a system can get really uh, expensive computationally, right? Because you might need to make this such detailed grid in time and such small time steps that sometimes for like I don't know fluid dynamic simulations you can require a lot of compute power, right? A lot of time in a in a big computer. So um, this goes to the extreme, for example, in, in the quantum mechanics of Dealing with the uh, uh, even if, if if you want to do like uh, we look we had a physicist looking at this in uh, when we started just to have an idea of the complexity. So the basic uh, thing in uh, uh, quantum mechanics is like the Schrodinger equation. So if the analytical solutions are like for a thing like with one particle or so. Even in that case, if you want to have some numerical approximation and you discretize your your space into let's say hundred buckets. And then you have three dimensions, it's already 100 to the power of three. And typically what you need to do is like create a matrix where that is like the dimension of uh, this, the, like the number of rows or columns, and then some, solve some sort of eigenvalue problem on top. So this is like, you just add one more particle or discretize a bit more, it's just like huge. <laughs> but in the end, uh, Actually, the inputs and the outputs of your function, they are low dimensionality. You just want to know the value of a function that has like uh, three inputs, like x, y, and z. And the output, if it's the wave function, is like uh, one, um, well, one, one uh, how do you say, complex number, so two values. Yeah? So what people started to do is like, can you actually train neural networks that try to learn this directly, this mapping, but they don't, to find a solution, they don't have to go to such an intermediate blown up state with such huge matrices. <laughs> the literature, and uh, now they are able to do it to some moderate size molecules, but it, it's an open problem. So the idea is, can you use machine learning to approximate to solutions to PDEs faster, right? So if you're a machine learning uh, engineer or researcher like me, what you would 
try to do immediately is like just follow a supervised learning approach, right? So you take whatever equation you want to model. So uh, you have a set of inputs in here. It will be like the if you are into B, it will be X, Y, and then T for the time component. And you would want to learn a neural network, which is a, a universal function, right? That represents, when it's trained, represents the function that is the solution to the PDE. It's pretty cool, right? Like what, what the function, what the neural network learned to represent, it's the solution to the PDE. So the, the way uh, I, I would do it, like if you can solve, you have, if you can assume you have a, a traditional solver for that uh, PDE, you just generate a big enough data set, right? Like first you solve it many times with the, whatever standard numerical method you have, create a big data set. And now you learn a neural network to on that data set. And you hope to generalize to variations, for example, of a boundary condition. So that when, if you, if you do this well, now given an unknown, uh, unseen boundary condition, like an initial temperature here, for example, your neural network would make this prediction like in just, you know, orders of milliseconds, just the inference of the neural network compared to running a, a, a solver. So, and this is a recipe, actually we are, I will tell you later, but we want to follow, but for much bigger systems. So using existing open source numerical simulators to generate a lot of data, that then we can distill into neural networks. I will tell when I tell you a little bit about what we are doing, you will see the connection. But one elegant thing that also came from the applied maths community and machine learning was this idea of physics informed neural networks. I don't know how many of you heard of it. It's a paper around 2017, I think, and now it's a flourishing area of research. And I will mention this, just an elegant example of uh, incorporating uh, previously known knowledge about physics into training neural networks very elegantly. So I mentioned before that uh, if you're trying to solve the PDE, you can just have, you know, different points uh, in, the, in the area of interest and try to fit it. But Maybe you don't have that many points, but if you know the physics of it and you know the partial differential equation that models it, well, there's something you can enforce in the loss function of the neural network, which is like, if your neural network is supposed to represent the solution to a PDE, <clears throat> then in any point it has to do that. So yeah, it's really okay. a constraint, even if you don't have a measurement, a data point there, you still know you still want that this relationship between the partial derivatives that you know that should be respected hold. And so if you are using any deep learning framework like PyTorch or TensorFlow or JAX or whatever, these are basically tools that allow you to do auto differentiation. So you have this neural network and is able to compute the gradient basically, right? So you can directly encode in the loss function of your neural network. Basically, this is the PDE you need to respect. It's like almost term by term written there. And these frameworks, uh, deep learning frameworks, can compute this for free for you, right? Like it's already implemented. This is like the derivative of my neural network and uh, partial to this input Boom. is this object. So you can directly encode it in, in, the, in the loss function. So this gave origin to what is called physics informed neural networks. Obviously, there's drawbacks because actually in the, in the vanilla version, you would have to train a neural network from scratch just to find the solution of one instance of a PD for a, a given boundary condition. And this might be much slower than actually any traditional solver that you already have for that. But the idea is that uh, if then you have further inputs like the geometry of something you are trying to model or the boundary conditions, and you are able to train it well enough that you are able to then pass unseen inputs of this kind, and your neural network makes an immediate prediction, then you can be faster than the traditional solvers. So now there's a, like uh, hundreds of papers or variations of these, like using, for example, hyper networks in which 
one network predicts the weights of the other one and this gets faster and so on. So it's like a lot of innovation going on in this field. Cool, so uh, just to give you an idea, circling back to what we are doing at Innovativa. So when we started, we wanted to be doing this kind of models of machine learning for uh, different domains of uh, physics reality, right? But we bumped into this problem, like, where do we get the perfect training data? It's like, I, we wanted to learn a model to simulate waves in the ocean and how do they change depending on the depth of the ocean or whether you have an obstacle there, things of this kind. So where do I get the data set that tells me the mappings from depths of oceans and wind speeds into what happens with the waves per perfectly everywhere? Doesn't exist, right? So we saw, well, but there are simulators of these people working in the, in different communities, implementing all kinds of open source simulators for different areas from fluid dynamics to molecular dynamics to structural mechanics and so on. So we started, okay, let's use them. And now how do we run them at scale? Like I want to run these 10,000 different simulations to generate the data set. How do I do this? We found that some simulators, you know, were written in Fortran by someone is like, how do I, <laughs> run 10,000 things in parallel in the cloud now. So actually what we started building was uh, a platform to make that easier, which is now called uh, Inductive API. So it's basically, you can think of HPC in the cloud by using just some Python code that is really easy to write. So we um, even the client, the package that you install is open source. You can, it's just like pip install in the Tiva. You need to get the API key to get access, but that's also easy. And then it's, it's like that. For example, I'll give you here an example of a scenario implemented with proteins, for example. Your code boils down to saying, okay, I want the protein solvation uh, scenario. This is the PDB file determined. It's like the initial shape of the protein. The temperature is something simulate and this does not simulate on your laptop this is sent, it's sent to our server to simulate so now the beauty of this is that you know we can really optimize we can have the best gpus best hardware the best configuration for this and furthermore if ah, okay so you send the request to the server and we can run this in a, very efficiently but the beauty beauty of this which i don't know if you can see here ah yeah is that now if you want to do simulate all the proteins in say, say the human proteome, which is like 20,000 proteins, you just have a for loop. <laughs> it's just like, okay, I will loop, loop over all of these proteins, simulate them. And then in, the, in our servers, we just deal with the complexity of launching lots of virtual machines and running all of them in parallel. And your code from running one simulation to 20,000 is just like one more line of code. So, um, we also actually expose that more direct access to the simulator. In the, in the previous slide, I showed you uh, a scenario that is already pre-configured, like putting a protein inside of a box of water. But if you are an expert for the, in uh, molecular dynamics, you can directly say which commands you want to run in Gromax. Actually, it's one of the things I would like to learn from these communities, like what kind of open source simulators does your community use? Um, because we can really easily integrate new simulators like in a matter of a couple of days. Um, so yeah, our goal is kind of like simulate anything easily at scale. We'll deal with the complexity of managing the computational infrastructure and then basically progressively try to bring more and more machine learning components to it, right? Once you... <coughs> Once you, you are able to simulate some well-defined scenario, then we can replace that or extend with a much faster approximation that is uh, powered by a neural network. So for example, an example we have here and are working on now, it's a, a wind tunnel. So in fluid dynamics, um, a simulator we are using is called Open Home. You can say, okay, I have this shape of an object, like this 3D mesh. I want to simulate what happens if you put it inside of a wind tunnel with this much wind speed coming from the entrance. And it computes, computes something like this. 
the pressure uh, everywhere in the surface or the streamlines or coefficients like the drag coefficient and so on. What we can now do again is follow this recipe. We have generated like um, lots of shapes. Actually, I think I have it here. Even some sort of random shapes. Run the, the CFD simulations. And now we have a data set. Now I want to train a neural network actually a particular architecture, which is called a mesh net network, is a particular kind of graph neural networks, <laughs> that take as input the full three-dimensional mesh and can predict also an object of the same kind, also a 3D mesh, but now with the pressure values everywhere. And basically this is ground truth and this is prediction by the neural network. The beauty of this is that this is maybe three or four orders of magnitudes faster than doing the simulation because Doing the inference step of a neural network is like orders of uh, 50 milliseconds or so. Whereas running a, a detailed simulation of this could be half an hour, one hour or more, right? Depending on the resolution you want to, to do. So our vision is that if you are doing problems of uh, like optimal design, you want to try many different combinations. This could happen in terms of finding the best shape of a car or finding what is the drug that best binds with the protein appears everywhere. You will first ask the machine learning super fast models, like what's your prediction? <coughs> and then on top, you will do some, on the most promising candidates, you will do some uh, uh, more high precision simulation. And then maybe you go to real scale, uh, real world implementations of that. Cool, so how am I in time? Yeah, Okay. So, I just want now to say a few words of why is all this working, right? It's all the same kind of techniques and maybe a community like, like yours was not using uh, deep learning a few years ago and now it's also here, right? <laughs> well, the key thing about uh, deep learning is this problem of uh, <coughs> Learning good representation. So one of actually the one of the biggest conferences in the machine learning now is actually called the International Conference on uh, Learning Representations. I clear uh, I see alarm. Which is the whole idea of going from high dimensional inputs like images, text, sound, view, formulas, or representations of molecules into a representation that is uh, numerical and is just a vector of some dimension, right? Like say 128 numbers. And pretty much every problem almost in AI becomes trivial if you have found a good representation of that thing, which is the hard part. So neural networks are the ideal tool for this because it's very flexible architecture and it's very easy to deal with different modalities of inputs, either images or time series or text and so on. It's very easy to decide, you know, do we have more parameters, less parameters? What is the size of my bottleneck layer where I want to really learn that latent representation and so on? It's like, it's like Lego bricks, right? You can experiment with all of this really easily. So neural networks in general will try to cheat. What I'm, do I mean by this? If you all, if you are training a neural network to distinguish a car from a boat, and all, and you have, you can have ten million pictures, but if they all look like this, for example, boats tend to appear on water, which is kind of blue, and road, and cars tend to appear on uh, roads, which are kind of gray. What the neural network will uh, learn to do is like, okay, this looks a bit more bluish, it looks a little bit more gray, so that's what I need. Um, so what you need is not only more data, it's also better data, more diversity, and especially more combinations of constraints. So the big boom of uh, deep learning happened when ImageNet, which was this big data set in computer vision, came out <coughs> around 2010, where not only it was big because you had one million images, the interesting part of it is not one million images that you have a thousand different classes or categories of objects. 
So not only you had cars and boats, you had uh, trucks, which are a little bit similar to cars, but they're a bit different, and, and a bus. Or you have boats, but you also have whales and dolphins. So you can cheat when you only have to distinguish cars and boats. But now, if there's water, but now it's no, it's not a boat. It's a jet ski, or it's a whale, or it's a dolphin, and you need to learn to distinguish between classes that are more and more fine grained. You should think of this as constraints. So the neural network is just learning a function that learns some representation and learns to split the space into some categories. But if they are really easy to split by cheating, you will learn something, a representation that kind of sucks. But if it, you are forcing it to be so detailed to distinguish you know, dolphins from whales and cars from buzz and, and different kinds of dog breeds, that's super hard, right? Like hundreds, dozens of different dog breeds. So it really cannot cheat. I cannot just look at the color. I cannot just look at texture of hair. It's like you really are forced to learn something that is close also to the representations we have in our brain. So what happened is that uh, if you are in this regime of you have huge amount of data and they're very high quality and it's putting a lot of constraints in what the neural network can learn. If you have a lot of computational power, and you know, generally enough neural network detections, which we have now have, representation learning is kind of basically solved now, which is kind of, which is insane, right? So this is illustrated by you know the results from you know this generative AI models, like for example, for images. If you say a description of you know a photo of a teddy bear on a skateboard in Times Square, and the model is able to generate this, it really means that two things happen: the representation that they have for uh, text information maps into a latent space that is so well learned that from there you can generate an image from there, and it really matches what you meant, right? And this would not be like in the data set. Because you can try very absurd things. You can say, any average, you can say, uh, okay, I'm the Pope came to Algarve and he's collecting uh, oranges. And the model will generate that, but that's not in the data set, right? Like there's no such picture. It just learned some components of the representation, like what is or some what is the Pope? What is an orange? What is the color of this? And it's so well aligned with the representations from uh, text as well, and they match so well in that uh, same latent space that you see these marvels happening, right? So our belief, and it, you see it coming now because uh, it's becoming more mainstream, is that this will happen everywhere, not only for images and uh, texts and videos and movies that you see now coming up, all domains of science and physical reality will benefit from this. So you will start having good neural representations of everything, like molecules or fluids or solids or map formulas, which are the slides that maybe I can show later. Um, and then you will be solving problems in this latent space of good representation where everything becomes easier. So, there's an open question though in the science domain, which is how do you incorporate previously well-established knowledge, right? Like, for example, I was, I was telling you that we were training neural networks for uh, the wind tunnel, but I mean, physicists <laughs> through the centuries distilled the knowledge of uh, fluid dynamics into like a formula. And now we have to kind of start from scratch training neural networks with millions of examples. Sounds a little bit inefficient, right? I mentioned one direction, which was like these physics informed neural networks, which at least bring a little bit of uh, previous knowledge, like symbolic knowledge to there, but they still need to train the neural network, going, uh, doing a lot of uh, steps of back propagation, a lot, a, lot, a lot of iterations, to somehow distill a little bit of that knowledge into the neural network ways. But it's, very, it's still very inefficient, right? So an open question is, you know, is there more, Efficient, but I think it's also one thing that you're interested in, right? Like, how do you incorporate uh, previous knowledge that is already well distilled into neural architectures? So, yeah, with this 
I conclude this part, and then if you want to go to the math slide, but, uh, like, <laughs> okay, we have time for thank the speaker. <laughs> That uh, takes a lot of time to collect. And basically, what we do is physics, basically, but it's hard to simulate, but it's possible. Have you at all tried to look at our type of spectra and look at the basic simulations for that uh, and doing something with that? I mean, things like you can change this thing quite rapidly. <laughs> No, I uh, yeah, I was trying to ask Dario when he invited me, which is like, uh, what open source, what can you simulate, and what existing software is there from first principle, right? Like, you have a solution, you put uh, I don't know water and salt there, different uh, concentrations, and then what is you measure with this? What is the spectra uh, that you will observe? If you have such simulators that work relatively well, then we can generate a huge data set with a lot of variety to train a neural network that is a, a, a bit of a foundation model, a bit like you were saying universal neural network, that is pre-trained on this huge data set uh, that you generate by simulated data first, and then you can fine tune it on, um, on real experimental data. So yeah, in this time that we don't have a solution on how to incorporate uh, symbolic knowledge we have directly in neural networks, I think the brute force approach is this one. It's like, if at least you can simulate it, you just generate a big data set, then train the neural network on that, and then you have a foundation model for that error. So this is why we built this platform to make this easier. Yeah, that's one of, that's just to add the same thing. Uh, I had a discussion last year with Christoph Beck from Innsbruck. Yeah. He's working on quantum simulations of spectra. So we were talking about this. He reached out to me to because he knew that I was working on deep learning on spectra. So he thought that I might help him on this. But we are still far away. I mean, <laughs> they, they use quantum quantum mechanic approximations to solve the vibrational spectra of of certain individual molecules, and it's individual molecules, right? They can simulate water, they can simulate like some aromatic uh, complex molecules, some, bi some biology, but not a mixture. Mm -hmm. Okay, and they can simulate the first, uh, the first, uh, the first moment, the first, the first absorption in the infrared. Here, I mean, at least for the chemometrics that I've been working, I, I was interested in near infrared. So it's the second and third harmonic combinations of these things. So he was telling me that that's still far away. I mean, that that might be a way in which they simulate the first harmonics, and then we can using neural networks on the same sample. I don't know if it is possible for raw materials, raw components, raw molecules to use a neural network in between to generate mm -hmm. the NIR spectrum. Maybe that's something, but open source simulator that people use to simulate this kind of NIR spectrum, as far as I know, there is a term. Mm -hmm. Probably there's people in the audience here. So yeah, to, to, to put that another way, if we knew how to do the simulation, we'd know how to solve the problem. That's, <laughs> that's, yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, okay. But then, okay, that's interesting because in many cases it's not true, right? Like uh, there's many inverse problems in science in which you know how to do, compute in this direction, but then it's hard to do the other way around, right? And this, you are dealing with a inverse problem, right? Um, so, sort of, but we really, really don't know how to do this thing. Yeah, Colin, I would like to, to comment that I think the kind of variance or noise structure is kind of different in biology from physics. Um, so your biology example in the beginning, I think it's kind of special compared to the biology you're talking about here in agriculture or, or things like that. In that protein folding, I think it's a very precise process. In other words, if those sequences wouldn't kind of lead to robustly to that structure, we wouldn't be able to live. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and that, but on the other hand, the, the kind of 
things that that happen when you grow stuff or fields under the very kind of climate or conditions or weather are far more variable. Oh yeah, but um, I, I was not talking about even going there. I was mean just simulating, for example, I don't know, water or no, yeah, yeah. just a sort of protein or some you some fatty acid. calculations, and then if you're well in that, you know, by correction factor of one point eight to. Approximately. Yeah, the, the thing is that when you start mixing, instead of having you know, like these sharp peaks, it starts to broaden up and mixing everything together. So everything gets convoluted under the same broad peaks, and it's it's like it's an additive problem. You can, it, we, at least as far as I know, we, can, we cannot decorrelate them or separate them, right? Okay. So, uh, Hakim, you have a question? Okay. No? Okay. Um, Jai? So, uh, myself is that I think one of, one of the problems we, we have to solve for this physics model is that how do we initialize layers? So, we have, we have, we have, this, uh, we have this advanced very much on layer initialization, but we know that transfer learning works very well because if everything is already, uh, is already cooked, it's like it's, the, the layers have uh, have have meaningful meaningful relationships. For example, you know that uh, if if you train uh, a deep neural net, net, what you get at the first convolution away is very similar to, to the brain cells that we have on, on the, the primitive of cortex, for example. Like those two, and we have we have mimicked those with Gabor filters for a long time. So we have we are getting neural networks to learn Gabor filters again. So what what I think is that. For, for specific types of physics problems, we will probably uh, advance further if we have a good way of initialization that reduces the time, the iterations that we need to get anything meaningful out of it. Do you have anything uh, done about that or have you thought about it? Yeah, I mean, the way I was imagining it's along those ways, but it's like you have. Um, a synthetic data set generated by simulation, and it might be in a regime that is not so uh, representative of real life, like you know dealing with the uh, food and so on. It's more closer to the spectrum of uh, basic elements, basic ele uh, molecules. But you train a neural network in a regime that it needs to predict both data sets at the same time. I don't know if you'd split the upper layers. Uh, you know, multitask, predict one task here and the other here, or it's exactly the same output potentially. But you'd have a lot of synthetic data that will help shape the representations of the neural network in ways that you, you can trust because it's like uh, physics based and it's like a, a perfect, perfect, uh, it's much better regularization, right? It's not just doing L2 norm, decreasing L2 norm or, or something of that kind or, or at least some cross validation is actually extra knowledge of the domain that is coming through. So it's additional data. Uh, then, yeah, obviously then we cannot compare the representations as you know things we have in our brain because it doesn't map anymore. But the way I would see it is that way. Are there any comments on the slide transfer part? Basically, because spectra are the worst to start with, because of they are so convoluted and because the matrices from the quantum mechanics and the couplets you would have even with a single molecule is really complicated and those matrices are really huge from like the, the quantum mechanical perspective. So the way maybe to start would be like uh, NMR spectroscopy or FTIR, they are very aligned. Uh, even though there are nonlinear impacts, which you would need to account because of the because of the, the Topology of the problems, you know, the protein form. Mm -hmm. But there are other spectral regions, I think, which would be easier to start. And then I have a, if I may have a question, since you are generalists, I like that a lot. So, and you mentioned the free particle problem. So, if you make these free particles, like the double pendulum, leads to theory of chaos. Right? So, my question is, from your machine learning perspective, like is that also doing in the computers? Is that also a future? Did you think about how to tackle the 
any kind of chaos happening in the physics system? Ah, so uh, let's see if I understand the question. You are saying that in some domains, maybe like uh, in fluids or uh, I don't know, weather prediction, even if it's a deterministic system, it can be chaotic. So small changes in the initial conditions can lead to... I, I haven't worked in that in particular, but there has been results. So uh, DeepMind also worked in weather prediction and they use graph neural networks to forecast weather and again, they trained with a lot of uh, real data and I guess simulated data. And it seems to be performing very well, but I don't know. I, I don't have a feeling of uh, what happens. It's possible that, um, it's possible that uh, a neural network by aggregating global information about the system can actually learn to distinguish whether you are in a regime in which small perturbations in an area will have drastic effects or not. But one thing is clear, I mean, it cannot be my, it's still a computation. So if the computation you would need to do to get the right answer is like, in terms of computational complexities, much bigger than what the neural network can do, it cannot capture, it doesn't solve everything, right? It's like what now about large language models, you are predicting one token at a time. So if you are asking, it actually related to the math, to prove a, a theorem like uh, some Poincaré uh, conjecture or so, it's a, a neural network predicting the next token will not have the ability to do this because you need to search a huge search space to get the right answer. And the system is not designed to do that, right? So in, is, in, conceptually, is it even possible to predict? It depends on what you want to predict. That's the point. So if you want to predict uh, each, uh, each all, uh, in a way it's a completely story. Then, uh, for example, predicting the uh, some physical properties of the system, which are again determined by the stable, or let's say some stable, um, or the dynamical properties of the system, which completely depends, I would say, on what you want to predict. So, so if you want to predict everything, like the property of orbits, etc., on getting uh, as much computation uh, or more, so that you can be just by fixing the system. Um. I guess also if you say that chaotic means because of this instability that over small changes on the input space you have fast changes on the output space, then it means that if you get an arbitrarily high complexity, which kind of if you want the the neural network to usually approximate the somehow smoothish function, yeah. it's it's kind of the opposite direction. And it would need well arbitrary complexity for yeah. to produce the arbitrary complex output. But there are things in between as well. We can also train a neural network to predict uh, the dynam dynamics, for example, in molecular dynamics, or in fluid. You would need to simulate the next step. And by hand, you cannot write. Uh, you don't know how to write a, a solver that predicts a hundred steps ahead or a, or a thousand. Because we can only do it, uh, you know, uh, program with a linear approximation. We know how to write the code for that. But you can train a neural network on trajectories. And now, instead of asking you to predict the next step, you take, predict 100 steps ahead or 1,000. And if you do this well enough, you can have a neural network that also simulates the dynamics but makes bigger jumps ahead. And this is quite interesting as well, which is what we, you would call AI accelerated simulation, which is, I, I find, fascinating as well. Yeah, I've I've seen just to add something. I have seen people publishing in the realm of mathematics and deep learning how to uh, neural networks that work semi symbolically, and they, the solutions that the neural networks present have bifurcations, like we see in chaotic systems. So they're they're able to to simulate some kind of chaotic systems, but the I know that happens, but I, I don't know what it does. So, Harold, please. It's a very fascinating lecture you gave, and uh, it's fascinating to see, to, to, to think about what this can bring to science. Uh, I have a cognitive question to you. Before that, I would just say that in the wrong hands and with the wrong motives, uh, like making fake, fake videos and so on, this is horrible in the sense that we can really make people lose our 
trust in our own citizens, which is bolstering for society. But that is a variety of I have a question here about the cognitive aspects. There is the form or mathematical formulas, or there is a definitely very right, or there is even the hidden or known ways, laws of nature that we may understand or may not understand. So that just one domain. Then there is, so this is what the map is, what it looks like, what it is. And we can think about that in one. The other one, what it does, the simulations. And we have done quite a lot of not very meta modeling or a lot of different nonlinear equations and all the big furnaces and so on. And it's amazing how, <clears throat> how the two thought models uh, split people because some people like the mother and some people like the doctor. And very people, very few like, like both. So, have you met? Do you have? How do you deal with? Or am I right in saying that these are two very different sides? Both are equally important about mathematics. What it does is also mathematically important, although from formal point of view, it is what it is that we define as mathematics. Yeah. So I don't know if I will answer exactly the question, but so if you think about. What's science is, it's also about this finding patterns in uh, data, right? Observational data, and you want to extract some patterns. This is exactly what uh, machine learning does. It's about learning patterns about data. Now, the way you represent the pattern might take very different shapes. So one way might be represented through a formula, and there's actually a field in machine learning called symbolic regression, where you actually try, to, what you learn are actually formulas, so you can, Pass data that is like orbits of planets, and then you have a big range of uh, formulas you can have, like polynomials and so on and so on, and many different terms. And the machine learning algorithm will output the formula that best describes this data. So in this case, it's totally interpretable. It's like what Newton would do, right? Like it's like okay, this is the formula that best describes. Training neural networks, uh, you don't have such a neat representation. It's not just a formula. You have these sets of weights, right? Uh, but then, like you said, even if you have a formula and you have perfect understanding, right, you know Navier-Stokes equation for fluids. Now what? Uh, simulate uh, the waves in this uh, coastal area. Well, now it becomes a computational problem. Even though you know the basics, you need to, to still simulate. So it, it doesn't matter if you know the formula, you cannot give me the answer unless you put a lot of compute. And yeah, neural networks can also help here because you can train them to distill computation into knowledge, into intuition. So that's what happened when you have a neural network to play Go or chess. It's a bit the same. You could do a brute force search, which uh, has been done in the past, but you can also use that data set to learn a neural network that then has intuitions, and it's really like human intuition, on what is the best move, because I've seen so many similar things. Uh, I just feel it. Okay, this is probably a good move. So. Neural networks are a way of distilling compute time into something. It's like you pay for it in advance while you are training or doing a lot of computation, but then you see new things and you have intuitions much faster than doing the full computation. I don't know if you kind of. <laughs> I have a perhaps a naive question, but uh, it's, it seems to me that. Um, we can summarize several of the situation you presented, a situation in which you have a huge domain of possible solution with, with several minimal. So with respect to more traditional optimization algorithms, like the monotonic or whatever, what does the the neural network or does differently or more efficiently? Yeah, so that's a very good question. I think um, I can give an example, which is uh, so. If uh, or let me answer it first this way: many optimization algorithms, if you, if they are gradient based, you can follow them quickly, but they will get stuck in some local optimal, right? And if you need to do some um, other method that is not gradient based, you need exhaustive search in many points, right? But for some problems. 
from the inputs, you can get a very good feeling of what the final answer should be. So for example, I was talking about this at lunchtime. Uh, in computer vision, what, what computer vision does is like take, a, uh, oh, sorry, what computer graphic does is like, I take a representation, 3D representation of this object, and I know how it will look like from here. That's computer graphics, generating images, right? Computer vision is the inverse computer graphics. It's like, I get an image and I need to infer what is the 3D state of the world. But that's a hill defined problem because for a, a given projection, there could be an infinite amount of number of uh, 3D shapes that would generate that projection. For example, here, if, um, if this uh, column there, this pillar was like 100 meters long behind, for me, the same, it would be the same projection. But now if you have a data set with many 3D shapes and projections, images, you can train it to ask, so what is the 3D shape? And because I have, ex you can learn the expectation that this is a pillar that I'm inside the room, it will actually be cylindrical. It will not be this other thing that is like 100 meters long that would generate the same image, but you <clears throat> develop a feeling of what are the most likely, out of the set of possible answers that would generate this one, what is the most likely? And that's where I think machine learning can help. You see? So that's why now you see uh, startup companies that do this exactly. You upload an image of something and it gives you a 3D mesh of the shape of the object. But it's fundamentally is a hill defined problem because there could be many 3D meshes that will generate that image. But because they saw so many real world objects, they will make the prediction that is likely in this world that we need. And actually, the brain is really good at that already. So why couldn't we teach a model to be good at it? And that's what we're doing now, right? Yeah, and the, uh, the uh, sorry, the brain is good, but it's also full. That's why you go to these uh, uh, exhibitions in the museum where you enter this room, and uh, it fools your brain, right, into believing that things are in a certain way, but actually they are laid out all distorted to look that way. So again, your brain is really creating this expectation. In that case, it's wrong with reality, but on purpose, right? So, so thanks for a really interesting talk. One, one of the messages I took from it is that the very successful applications you described were really pretty much handcrafted for the, for the application. And what we're doing mostly, not universally as a community, is taking something that works really nicely for image analysis and hoping to work for us. I mean, I don't know whether you agree, but I feel we should actually be thinking a bit harder about what we do. Claudia, one last question. Yeah. Uh, actually, um, I was wondering when when you train your models on the physics, physical simulations, um, how do you decide which input points to tackle next? How, how do you decide your training data? Do you just put the, the mesh like it was before, or do you have a method to say, okay, let's find out that in this region the model doesn't predict well, so let's have some example from here and simulate that? No, you could. We didn't get to that level. We just generated uh, a lot of random shapes and we trained that way. But uh, you could, there's a subfield of machine learning called active learning in which you try to focus your data collection and observations in the areas where you want to get better, you reduce the uncertainty about, about those areas. But uh, we were not doing this here. Okay, you can catch them up in the, in the Zoom conference, you'll be around, right? So the next